Good morning and welcome to our webinar webinar today titled Leveraging Your Business Data to Save Time and Increase Efficiency. Uh, my name is Brian Jackson. I'm the president and COO of Abbas Technologies. And we're going to start this morning by meeting our panel of professionals that will be hosting and, and participating in the webinar today. First, we have David Brown. He serves as the product owner uh, of our Abacus business intelligence team. He's been a CPA for several years and has worked both as an auditor in public accounting, but also um, as a controller in the industry environment. So David loves understanding how things work, whether it's internal combustion engine, manufacturing processes, computer programs, or multi-million dollar businesses. And that is a lifelong passion of his. We also have Kenneth Moore. Uh, he's been with the BMS's family for over 10 years, uh, recently joined Navis Technology as part of the business intelligence team. Uh, he specializes in uh, extracting data, uh, Power BI, and working with Excel. Kenneth is also a licensed product owner and scrum master. Finally, we have Jeremy Shank. He is the Scrum Master of the Business Intelligence Team and leads their effort in increasing efficiency of clients around uh, the southeastern United States by developing and implementing uh, automation and analytics systems. Uh, prior to joining our team here at Abacus, um, he was a support technician where he found his love of automation and creating programs to fix very common technical problems with computers. Uh, he often jokes that 70% of his job is figuring out how not to do his job and believes the best way to love your work is to automate all the boring stuff. So this will be our panel this morning. Our agenda, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit, I'm gonna introduce the topic of business intelligence. Uh, then we're gonna talk about analytics, automation, and then how both of these topics and areas can save you time and also increase efficiency in our business. So let's start this morning and to introduce our topic, um, what is business intelligence? The typical scientific definition of business intelligence reads that basically the way an organization uses technology to find and visualize data to make and act upon well-informed decisions. Here at Abacus, we define business intelligence as the following. We're turning data into information and information into action. So with that thought and definition, I'm going to turn it over to David Brown, who's going to kick us off talking about analytics. Thanks for that introduction, Brian. Uh, so we'll begin today by discussing this first pillar of business intelligence, and that's the analytics portion. But before we dive into the details, let's start with the why. So why should we care about data analytics in the first place? So business owners and management usually understand that their data has value, but just how valuable is it? Let's look at one CEO who literally struck gold with his business data. So Rob McEwen was the CEO of Gold Corp Inc. And he knew that he was sitting on a fortune, but he just didn't know exactly where it was located. His Red Lake mine was only producing about 50,000 ounces of gold a year at a high production cost of $360 per ounce. And at the same time, gold prices were at historic lows uh, under $300 an ounce. So he triggered this new gold rush by issuing this extraordinary challenge. He put all of his company's geological data, which went back as far as 1948, into one file and shared it with the whole world. McEwen hoped that the outside experts would tell him where to find the next 6 million ounces of gold. In return, he offered a cash prize $575,000 to participants with the best methods. The Gold Corp Challenge was launched in March of 2000, and 400 megabytes worth of data about the company's Red Lake Mine, which is a 55,000 acre site, was placed on the company's website. Everything that the company knew about the Red Lake Mine was just a mouse click away. As McEwen hoped, word spread fast around the internet, and within a few weeks, Submissions started coming in from all over the world as more than a thousand virtual prospectors chewed over the data. Some were from geologists, but many were from individuals in unrelated sectors. There were mathematicians, military officers, students, and consultants. The top winning entry was a collaborative effort by two groups from Australia. 
from the opposite ends of the earth and without ever having visited that part of Canada, Fractal Graphics in West Perth and Taylor Wall and Associates in Queensland developed a 3D map of the mine. It included powerful computer graphics that allowed McEwen and his geologist to see the real potential in Red Lake. The Gold Cork Challenge was a huge success. In all, more than 110 sites were identified and half of these were previously unknown to the company. Of these new targets, more than 80% yielded significant gold reserves. McEwen believes that this collaborative process cut two to three years off the company's exploration time. In less than 10 years, the worth of the gold that was mined in those new sites exceeded $6 billion in value. The prize money was only a little over half of a million dollars, so it was a fantastic return on his investment and much cheaper than continuing with the unproductive exploratory drilling. McEwen understood that there was value in his data. He also felt the pressure to make good business decisions based on that data. The Gold Corp Challenge allowed him to turn that data into information and that information into action. All right, so hopefully that helps us kind of set the stage for what's the potential for our data. But now we really need to understand what exactly is data. And you can say it, either data or data. Everybody disagrees on that one. Every person and every business creates data. Often we create it without even realizing it. Every time we swipe our key card to enter our building, every time our smartphone pings GPS to tell us where to turn, we're creating data. It's estimated that approximately 1.1 trillion dollars or trillion megabytes of data is created every single day. So more data means more to go through, but it also means the potential for more insights. So data is simply facts about things that have happened. This may be structured data coming from our point of sale system, our time and billing system, our inventory systems, or it might be unstructured data such as customer surveys, images or documents that are stored on our file share or document management system, or even just web search results. So data by itself can be a very fuzzy picture. Fuzzy pictures are not particularly helpful in making solid business decisions. Once data has been collected though, making sense of that data and organizing it in a way that tells a story turns our raw data into information. This process is one of the critical parts of a good business intelligence plan. How data is organized, as well as the assumptions that we make in that process, dramatically impact the story the data tells once we get to this information stage. If this process is done thoughtfully and within a sound framework, the data begins to create a clear picture. What was a fuzzy mass of data is now a clear picture of information about the business and its operating environment. Information is great and clarity about what's happening within the business is invaluable. However, that isn't the highest and best use of the data and the information that we have. By evaluating the business processes that influence the data, we're able to move beyond just general information and actually to actionable insights about the data. This is where businesses create competitive advantage. Within, with insights from the data, we can actually make business decisions that drive better results for the business. So now let's dive into the details of how an Abacus Business Intelligence Services help you turn business data into insights and those insights into action. All right, so like we've already talked about, data is really the first step. So since it's simply facts about events that have happened, there really are almost endless sources of data. Businesses often focus on their operational and financial data, but other sources of relevant data may include market pricing, re related industry data, even weather data. Business leaders must make decisions about how wide of a view that they wanna take when it comes to the data that they have um, before them so that they can make better business decisions. All right, so before I dive into the details of this, and I've been talking for a couple of minutes, do we have any questions so far? 
Uh, yeah, David, one question came in, and if you're part of the attending, in attendance day and you'd like to put in a question, please feel free to use the Q&A portion uh, in the Zoom interface. So we did have a really good question come in. Uh, it did say, um, reading it, it says, our company has multiple software for tracking all types of company information. Some are older, uh, some are on premise, some are actually based in the cloud. Um, when we look at maybe combining this data to produce analytics, um, is that even possible? Can we take data from multiple systems and combine it in order to produce analytics or produce uh, reports? So, David? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, yes, thankfully, there are tools out there now, uh, and we utilize them all the time, uh, that can take data from a variety of sources. I think Power BI says that you can use up to a thousand data sources uh, in, in one data set. So, uh, yes, we can definitely take um, take data from each of those different platforms uh, and sources. Sometimes that's uh, limited by what access you have to the software, uh, especially when you talk about cloud. Uh, but but most systems nowadays have connectors that allow you to get your data out of those systems and to be able to start using it to make better business decisions? That's a great question. All right, so let me dive in now on our, and I see if you're here for CPE, looks like our first poll question came up. So make sure and submit that if you'd like to get CPE credit. We'll have these poll questions pop up uh, all along throughout the presentation. So um, please keep an eye out for those. All right, so these four main questions that we need to ask about our data before we really start trying to turn it into information or actionable insights. First off, is the data accurate? Inaccurate data can tell a great story. It just won't be what's reality. An example of this uh, was when a company was looking for potential purchasing card fraud in a data set. One user had several red flags, higher transaction counts, higher overall spend, uh, a variety of red flags. So the internal audit team felt certain they were about to get a big win. However, after further investigation, it turned out that their internal data had associated this card number with a user in an administrative position where they would have expected low spend, low transaction counts. But in reality, the card was issued to a sales rep that had a significant client base. So where it seemed like there was fraudulent activity going on based on the data being used, that wasn't the reality. Next question is, is the data timely? Almost as bad as inaccurate data is out of date data. Data needs to be timely enough to actually help us make relevant decisions. For some evaluations, last year's information may be useful, but for many decisions, that's just not relevant any longer. If I'm quoting the construction of a deck and the lumber prices in my quoting software are three months old, then I'm probably going to be building that deck for less than what the materials cost me. Next is the data complete. When we're trying to make a decision and I'm looking at all the data that should be there. If my data source only gives me data for the weekdays, but there's relevant data points on the weekends as well, I'm making a decision based on incomplete data. And finally, is it comprehensive? Comprehensive and complete are similar, but they're not quite the same. If a data set that I'm using has missing points, it's not complete. If there are other data sets or other data points that I don't have, and they would be relevant to my decision, then it's not comprehensive. So a business owner trying to evaluate the manufacturing division would have incomplete data if the weekend crew didn't follow the same clocking in and clocking out process. That's missing data points. If the timekeeping system doesn't track the production line that a worker was on, that data would not be comprehensive. So once we've addressed these questions about data, we can begin really exploring the data. So we've got our data sets under control. The next phase of a BI engagement is analyzing the data to discover what story does the data tell. Analysis is all about identifying the real information from the data. This is where the fuzzy becomes clear. Before we start applying analytical procedures to the data, we've got to define some key performance indicators, KPIs. You'll hear me talk about that a good bit throughout the rest of this. The key performance indicators may be leading, 
forward looking indicators or they might be trailing historical indicators. Both are important and both are valid. These are the measures that management's going to use to evaluate business performance. They're also the measures that they'll use for making those business decisions. So management involvement in this phase is absolutely critical. Once these are defined for the organization, we can begin evaluating the impact of the various data points on these KPIs. At this stage, we begin using statistical analysis methods to find factors that are related to those specific KPIs. We can also perform regression analysis to see whether those predictions can reasonably be made. During this stage, the data is going to be sliced and diced to determine any actionable insights that we can get from the data. We look to answer questions like, what's the correlation between data points? What trends can we expect in the future based on past performance? Where are the outliers or the anomalies within our data sets? And what are the leading indicators that predict changes in the KPIs? When this analysis is completed, we're able to truly define expectations. This gives us something to test against. For those of you who uh, love the scientific method, this is where we create our hypothesis to test. So finally, this model that we've built is tested using historical data and our predictive outcomes are compared to actual. Adjustments are made as needed to give us acceptable levels of confidence. Once the data model and the related metrics and measures have been validated, then we can begin feeding in current data to the model. Reports are generated, organizations' data and anomalies are identified. And this is where we often find that low hanging fruit. These are the items that an organization can take action on immediately from these initial reports. <clears throat> so now that we've made sense of the data, we've started making some changes. How do we see the impact of those changes though and keep improving? And this is where data visualization becomes a game changer. When it comes to using the information and the insights that we've gained, speed of decision-making is critical. Decision latency is a term that we love using in our um, Scrum team uh, because it impacts a lot for what we do. But decision latency is the amount of time that it takes for a team to make a decision in response to a business change. For even the most sophisticated teams, the time between noticing a change, formulating the questions around it, reaching an answer, and taking action can be days or even weeks. That's where visual representation from our data can drastically improve the quality of our decisions and how quickly we can get to those decisions. Meaningful dashboards should present visuals that indicate when something is outside of the expectation or the standards. Often these visuals are directly tied to the key performance indicators that we discussed previously. But good visuals help prevent the all too common paralysis of analysis. If action required is not easily seen from the information, then individuals or teams often spend large and unhelpful amounts of time analyzing the details that don't actually provide insights about the problem or about the solution. This can be deceptively engaging work because it seems like we're really digging into the data. We're, we're, we're testing this, we're looking at that, but in reality, it may actually be reducing our effectiveness by delaying us taking action to address the real change or the real problem that needs to happen. Dashboard level visuals that clearly indicate where the problem is allow us to focus on the right information faster. But sometimes that high level KPI, it isn't sufficient to tell us what underlying data has changed and caused the issue. That's where linking the dashboard visuals to interactive reports helps decision makers dive into the relevant details and make better decisions faster. Interactive reports allow us faster analysis of what's causing those variances from the goals or expectations. These reports have drill down ability to get to the point where the actual change needs to happen. They also allow us filtering out aspects of the data that are not part of the problem and that don't need adjusting. Getting to the root of the issue 
within the data allows management to use laser focus on the issue and not get sucked into that paralysis of analysis or into a long decision latency time. One issue that we sometimes hear from managers is that the right people don't look at the reports often enough to catch something that changes or needs to be addressed. The great thing is that once these visualization tools are in place and the expectations have been set, we can also set up alerts that can be used to notify the appropriate people that, hey, something's out of line. You need to go look at this. These alerts allow businesses to have true continuous monitoring of their key performance indicators. Looks like we've got another poll question. Don't want you to miss that in case you had looked away from the screen. All right, so visualizations are a great way to improve decision making, both the quality and the speed of those decisions. The process of capturing our relevant data, organizing it to make sense of our market and the operational environment, and then building out reporting to support faster and better business decisions often transforms the management of a business. When we have a clear picture, problems begin to look like opportunities. Labor shortage in a market, that's a problem. But if you know the key drivers and you're able to adjust your business accordingly to attract the talent that your competitors can't, that's an opportunity. Your mine is producing too little gold at costs above the market pricing, that's a problem. But if you know where to deploy resources to boost production and the quality of the output, that's an opportunity. This sounds like a great place to end our conversation. And it is where most business analytics services end. But is there more that we can be that can be done? The transformation we've discussed so far often reveals that highly skilled individuals spend substantial time making decisions and performing tasks that don't actually match their skills. This is where we transition from just business analytics to real business intelligence. That's where automation comes in. And for that, here's my teammate, Jeremy Shank, to discuss that in more detail. Thanks, David. Um... And before we get too into it, I just want to tell y'all thank you for joining us today. And I know that that was a lot of information. It's good information. I do it every day. I love it. But trust me, I know it's a lot. And we're about to look at more, but I just want you to take one moment, take a breath, lean back in your chair. I believe we'll have a poll question up so you can uh, look at that briefly. And um, as you're answering that, we will go into our regularly scheduled webinar. And so two weeks ago, you may have been part of the BMSS economic update webinar. If you were, you likely heard Anup Mishra say that the Federal Reserve does not expect labor markets to return to pre-pandemic levels. And so that should beg two questions. The first we're gonna look at is how do I accomplish the same volume of work with less people? And to do that, we're gonna discuss automation. But before we get too deep into it, I wanna talk about what automation is and what it is not. So you may recognize this um, image it is from the 2005 Charlie and the Chocolate Factory film. And in it, Charlie's father got pink slipped because a robot could twist the toothpaste caps on a tube of toothpaste cheaper and quicker than a person could. So automation is not computers stealing jobs. And I've always been afraid of this. It may be because I was at a young impressionable age when I watched this film. Uh, this was around the time that iRobot was coming out. Uh, Y2K just happened. Being a child in the early 2000s was just a wild thing. Uh, this has always stuck with me. And whenever we come in and talk about automation, sometimes people 
get a little afraid because they're worried they're not going to have much to do with their roles. But instead, what automation is, is computers doing repetitive tasks to save you time. A lot of people may think that they're too small for automation, but really everyone uses automation. If you've ever right-clicked on your computer to delete a file, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but that's not actually how computers delete files. If you've ever swiped a credit card, you've used automation. If you've ever woken up in the morning and instead of grinding the beans, putting them in a filter, putting the filter in the coffee maker, filling the coffee maker up with water, and then pressing the brew button, you've used a Keurig, you've used automation. Uh, as you can imagine, this topic has consumed my uh, home life in the last week or so. And the other night while my wife and I were making dinner, she pulled out her phone and she said, hey Siri, set a alarm for five minutes from now. And Siri came back and spoke and said, all right, we've set the alarm. She looked at me and said, automation. So everyone can use automation. You go to work, you know you have to do, and frankly, you kind of dread it. And that's what we want to do. From tasks like these that are on the screen to those really small ones that you might do every few minutes, we want to automate those for you. And so real quick, I want to take a look at an example. And for those of you who don't know, a 1095 is a tax form related to the Affordable Care Act. Um, and I'm sorry, this is just going to be kind of the boring part of the show. We're talking about taxes, everybody's favorite subject. Um, but for 1095s, all large employers, so that's 250 employees and up, are required to fill one out with information about each employee's employment status, health coverage, and affordability for each month. So we had one client who was in the construction industry, and they had over 750 employees. Now, being in the construction industry, these employees were not always consistent. Depending on where the job was, what the job was, they may work a full-time load one month. They may not work at all the next. And a third, they might even work a part-time load. So for all of the, these employees, they had one person filling out the 1095 form by hand for every month, for every employee. And it looked a little bit something like this. And before I get too deep into this, I do want to say um, that I am not a tax expert. If you have questions about forms like these, please contact someone at BMSS or PBS to get help with this. And as you can see, someone on here might have to go through and click one of these pieces in here. So how do I do that? Well, I've got this employee right here. And for each of these months, I have to decide, were they full-time? Were they part-time? Did they take health insurance if they were full-time? And if they didn't, was it affordable? But how do I know how to do that? Well, I got to open up another report. So let's go open up another report. Okay, here we go. So right off the bat, here's employee 168. And just looking across the board, they worked a full-time load for each month of the year. That's great. So we can minimize that and come back over here. But since they worked full-time load, I have to know, did they take health insurance? Well, now I gotta open up a third report. So let's open up our third report. Here it is. This is an HCR report. Um, most so that you can see 
how many people were covered. And right off the bat, so I don't see 168, but I also see this is not in order of the employee ID. So I'm gonna have to search for employee 168. I don't find anything, okay? So this employee 168, see this is another problem with having multiple Excel files open to do this. I gotta find the right one. I'm gonna say that they did not take health insurance, but now I gotta find out why did they not take health insurance? So to do that, we're gonna have to pull up our calculator. And to calculate the affordability rate, we're gonna to need to take their wages. So that's going to be 33586. We're gonna to have to divide that by the months they worked. So that's 12. And then we're gonna to have to multiply that by the affordability rate for the year. And this year, that affordability rate was 9.83%. So nine, eight, three. So this employee could afford a healthcare premium that was $275.13. For this example, we're gonna use just around $200. So we're gonna say 2C, this person worked a full-time load. They did not take health insurance, but it was not because of any um, any affordability rates. And you see how long just that one piece took us. And we have, again, over 700 employees to do this to. And we kind of lucked out on that one because they worked all 12 months. Well, what about this employee right here? They were full-time one month and they didn't work all the rest or Let's see, this one right here. They worked two part-time months. As we go on and on and on, there's more and more intricacies. Um, there may be someone in here who didn't make enough to meet the, uh, the healthcare option. And so before we move on from this, uh, Rachel, if you'll pull up the demo question. I'm just inter interested, how many of you have had to create a report like this before? You've had to go through and do it manually. And while y'all are answering that, this is what we came in and did for this client. Uh, we created a form like this and see this safe harbor codes. This one is empty right here. All we have to do is type in the affordability rate and how much it costs to the employee. So we're gonna say 200. Click this button and it will calculate it for us. I see a lot of people were about even split on yeses and nos on that poll question, but a good amount of you said, I need to, but make someone else do it. Uh, Y'all are really gonna like this part. So we come in and we click this and it's gonna take a minute to calculate. So I'm just gonna move it over real quick. So y'all don't have to watch that calculate. So this client that we've been using as our example, in 2020, they were late and they suffered a $300,000 fine. In 2021, we stepped in, we created that program that you just saw to create, to create and find the data. And all in all, it took about half of a week for us to create that. And this year, after some updates to the safe harbor codes and some of the softwares getting updated, it took less than a day for us to update to get everything ready. And our point of contact said that the automation was a literal godsend because they could not complete these forms without our automation. And this is finished calculating, so I'm gonna pull it over. And you can see just right away how quickly 
just in the span of a couple of minutes while we were talking, that was all taken care of and worked out for this client. And this is one of my favorite examples to share for a couple of reasons. And the first is that it's built entirely in Excel. Most people, most of you probably on this call have access to Excel. And it by itself is a very powerful automation tool. So many things can be built in it and from it. And the second is that you get a really, a very real picture of how data from multiple sources, like David was talking about earlier, all of those coming together to create and inform action. This is one of the clearest pictures we have of that and how it can really save you time. So hopefully that example got you thinking a little bit of how you can increase your efficiency. And I want to move on to kind of what our groups of automations are. So the first group we have are those recurring automations. They're the ones that run on a set schedule. We have some that run every 10 minutes. And while we've been talking, those have ran three or four times by now. And our least frequent runs once a year. So that's something that at the end of the year, we have to do something to close out all of our previous business. And we don't have to deal with that anymore. It's a huge undertaking, as you can imagine, to close out the business for an entire year. But we knocked it down to where a computer does it for us. Our next bucket is our one-time automations. And I know that sounds a little bit like an oxymoron, but think of those things that maybe you only ever have to do at one time. But for that one instance you do it, you have to repeat it hundreds or thousands of times. So it could be taking all of the jobs in your business and updating them, assigning them to a new person. Uh, you could do that overnight. Maybe it would normally take you two days to do, but with an automation, it might only take you throughout the night and that computer's working on your business while you're asleep. And our third bucket is business process automations. So those, those are the things that you do the same thing every time, but there's not really a set schedule. So it could be every time you close a deal. It could be every time you add a contact. It could be every time you schedule a meeting. Think about those things that you do every time you schedule a meeting. Uh, are you interested in having those done for you? I know I am. We have one large company who utilizes all three of these buckets. And if you take all of the time they saved in 2021 and added it together, you would get 1,500 hours that they saved. Now, in a 50-week work year, that's an average of 30 hours a week that one company saved. I want you to think back to that feeling when we took our break. How relieved, how relaxed would you be if at the start of every single week, you knew that 30 hours of your workflow were already taken care of for you? You could take 30 hours off and only work 10 hours, or you could get 30 hours ahead of the competition. So real quick, before we move on to this next section, we've got another poll question. Um, Rachel, if you wouldn't mind pulling that up. How many Alabamians were affected by the great resignation in the third quarter? So while those are rolling in, uh, I'm seeing a few people click the closest answer. Um, I know I'm about to give it away, so uh, sorry for the spoilers, but it was about 250,000. Those of you that picked at least 20, good job. You found the loophole. At least 20 were affected. 
but it was closer to 250,000. So 250,000 Alabamians quit their job in the third quarter, just the third quarter last year. So we mentioned at the start, the Federal Reserve does not expect labor markets to return to pre-pandemic levels. We said that that should beg two questions. How do I accomplish the same volume of work with less people? And now we're gonna talk about how do I keep my people? And this is really one of my favorite things that automation can do. And to understand how automation is going to help us keep our people and keep them happy, we need to look at why people leave their jobs. So from LinkedIn's top five reasons people leave their jobs article, companies should consider how stale a job can become to employees when they are expected to do the same task day in and day out, or simply find the role too easy. The lack of opportunity to learn and develop is something I hear often from employees who end up seeking the opportunity elsewhere. The Balanced Career's top 10 reasons why employees quit their jobs. No one wants to be bored and unchallenged by their work, really. If you have an employee who acts as if they are, you need to help them find their passion. Employees want to enjoy their job. They spend more than a third of their days working, getting ready for work, and transporting themselves to work. And finally, Indeed's 16 reasons employees leave their jobs. After working the same job for a while, you start to get to know all your tasks and responsibilities quite well. When there's little more to learn in your role, you may start to feel like you're ready for more of a challenge. This is a natural part of growing in your career, especially as you become interested in learning new skills. So all of these articles and these lists get at a central idea. And it's that feeling of boredom or stagnation at work. The feeling of being stuck in a rut, doing the same thing day in and day out. Uh, Brian mentioned it before, but I am a scrum master for our team. Uh, and you may be thinking, well, that sounds like a made up title to make you feel better. And I got bad news for you. All titles are made up. Some of them have been around longer than others. But what I do is I implement this process called Scrum. And I could spend the next several hours talking to you about Scrum, but I will do my best to not do that to you. But one piece that I do wanna talk about is in Scrum theory, we have this idea of happy teams are more productive. With automation, we can see how happy teams are more productive but they can also stay longer. They're not stuck in that rut. The boring pieces that you do day in and day out, think back to LinkedIn's top five reasons. We can take those tasks and turn them into a thing of the past. And by doing that, we are not only going to increase the efficiency of your workforce, but keep them happy and retain them as well. So I just wanna ask you, how important is your time? How important are your people? We wanna give both of those back to you. And if you'd like to find out how, I'm gonna pass it over to Brian, where he is going to talk to you about some of our next steps. Jeremy and David for a wonderful presentation on the topics of both analytics and automations. We do have a couple of questions for our panel, uh, but before we take a look at those, I want to make sure all the attendees know how to get in touch with us um, if you're interested in learning more. Um, let me just your Just one second here. If you'd like to know more, please reach out to us at 205-443. 5900, and you can talk to Samantha Knight. She can definitely 
give you next steps on how we can continue this conversation. You can also email us at sknight at abacustechnologies.com. We'll also be making this presentation available via recording. So um, if you did attend today, uh, you can access it on the website for uh, viewing it again if you'd like to, but also please share it uh, with coworkers or professionals you know that might benefit uh, from this content. Now for the questions. Uh, I've got two or three here that I'd like to address the panel with. The first one, I believe I'm going to direct toward David uh, because he mentioned uh, these two in his uh, portion of the presentation. But David, he talked a little bit about leading and trailing in indicators. And could you tell us the difference between those indicators and maybe give us some examples of how they could be used in business? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so so our, our traditional ones that most people are familiar with are going to be your trailing indicators. Th these are the indicators that tell us how did we perform? I I'm looking back at last month or last quarter or last year. What was our profit margins? What was our gross margins? What was our sales numbers? Wh what were the clicks on our advertising campaign? These are all trailing indicators. They've told us what happened in the past um, and, and really driving around the performance of our organization. Leading indicators are much less um, obvious at times and much less um, precise in telling us a story. So they're, they're not as common. People don't, um, don't look into them quite as often. But leading indicators are the ones that tell us about a trend that will likely impact our operations or our performance in the future around one of those other um, KPIs that we've talked about. An example of this, um, back in my audit days, uh, one of my clients was uh, a pump manufacturer. They manufactured all kinds of different pumps, but specifically one of their areas was um, agricultural pumps for pumping liquid fertilizer. And so it was interesting to me that one of the metrics that they tracked was the price of corn, because the price of corn indicated what farmers were going to be planting in the upcoming spring season. Corn takes a different fertilizer than soybean. Different pumping equipment is used for the fertilizer that goes on corn versus on soybean or other um, crops. And so for them, having an indicator like the price of corn to predict how much volume of pump parts, um, of new pump sales that they might be able to anticipate based on what's the likely um, planting habits of farmers in the upcoming growing season. So that would be an indicator that's a, a leading indicator. The price of corn had nothing to do with the actual profit margins or um, or the supply of, of metal or plastics for their pumps, but it did indicate um, a lot for them. It was a great leading indicator that they could watch and predict how much volume do they need to be prepared for in the upcoming season. Thank you for answering that question. Very important question and some great examples there. Uh, next question, and this is really for the panel at large here. Um, are analytics required before starting with automation? So does one have to come before the other? So I'm going to open that to both David, Jeremy, and Kenneth, if y'all got some uh, input on that question. So to have a good automation, you really do need to have some level of data. We do not typically require a full-on data analytics reporting engagement before we do any automations, but we do start with a data discovery so that those automations we do can be uh, created for you as quickly as we possibly can. Thanks, Jeremy. And final question before we close out the webinar today. You know, you, you showed us, uh, you know, some screenshots of the tools we use. Obviously, we, we look at Excel quite a bit. But, you know, can you talk a little about the tools that uh, we use both for uh, analytics and also for automation, uh, you know, to maybe complete some of these projects you've talked about? 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'll be glad to start off on the uh, on some of the analytics side of things, and then I'll let Jeremy take over or Kenneth take over when we start talking about um, the automation side of things. From an analytics standpoint, uh, there are a tremendous number of tools that are out there and available uh, that, that do a lot of the same things. Um, one of our very first, and Jeremy alluded to this just a moment ago when we were talking about automation, but one of the very first pieces that we have to have in place is access to the data. Um, and so that can come from a variety of sources, oftentimes in organizations that may be a database structure that's holding the information. Those are great. We can use um, SQL Server Reporting Studio for that to be able to pull um, information. We can also use tools like Excel and Power Query that's built into Excel to be able to extract that information. When we get into cloud systems, um, sometimes that's direct API connections to be able to pull the information, uh, or sometimes it's other connectors. Um, there, there are a variety of tools to help us pull data um, from those cloud op, um, cloud systems to be able to get that into a format that we can then begin analyzing and making business decisions off of. Um, so that's uh, in the data world, that's the uh, ETL process, the extract, transform and load into our systems process. Um, and that's a key kind of starting point for us. Within the um, data analysis, Excel is a powerful tool, has a great, um, <laughs> people utilize like less than 5% of what Excel can do. And so there's a tremendous amount of value in just the power of some of the tools that are already at um, companies' fingertips. But beyond that, there are additional tools. Um, Alteryx is a great example that a lot of internal audit teams use when they're trying to do data analysis because it has a tremendous um, set of built-in algorithms and tests to be able to run on data sets to give those actionable insights. Uh, in addition to that, tools that help us to visualize, um, we, we love Power BI. It's a great tool set that most people have access to through their Office 365 licensing. Um, but there are a tremendous amount of powerful tools even built into Power BI, not just on the visualization side, but also on that data analysis um, part of it. So I'll stop there and let Jeremy talk to you. Yeah, so uh, we looked at Excel and David mentioned that most people are probably only using 5% of Excel. Um, just because you've got multiple open doesn't mean you're using all of Excel's utility. I, there's so many macros within Excel that you can record clicks. You can use, David also mentioned this, Power Query is the data engine behind both Excel and Power BI. And it takes those steps you do and it keeps them for the next time you load data in. It'll do all of the same uh, ETL process for as long as you're using that same Power Query script. Um, you also have probably heard two acronyms, RPA and API. So RPA is Robotic Process Automation. It's where the computer is clicking through, mimicking your mouse clicks and your keyboard strokes. And that's really great for automating some of those legacy systems that maybe don't have APIs. An API is an application um, process interface, I believe. And that's really just a translator between two applications. So we really love writing scripts in a language called Python that can do both robotic process automation and make API requests. And those can be used for the one-time automations that we talked about. They can also be put on a schedule for the recurring tasks. And we also use Office 365, and Office 365 has a wealth of tools for business intelligence, uh, not only Excel, but Power BI. And then for automation, you've got Power Automate, which can take those recurring tasks and do them on a set schedule very reliably. 
And then we've also built a few tools through their uh, application development called Power Apps. And that ties in really well to Power Automate so that you can create a form or an interface where your people can actually input data and then it automatically is put into your system in a meaningful way. Thanks again, David and Jeremy, for answering those questions. Uh, we, we really had, those are some great questions we had. I think, you know, to sort of wrap that, that topic up, I believe if you're a company that's using Office 365 right now for email, maybe you're using it for other applications as well, you already have access to many of the tools that we have uh, shown you today and talked about. So uh, that you're already started on the path to start uh, looking at analytics and automation. Uh, this is going to wrap up our webinar for this morning. I want to thank all of you uh, in attendance. And uh, we've got our contact information on the screen now. So if you'd like to learn more and continue this conversation, feel free to reach out to Samantha. You can also scan the QR code to start an email message immediately. And please don't forget that we will be having this webinar uh, available uh, to and all the participants and, and maybe those that were not able to pretend to, uh, attend today as well. Please share it. Uh, and please let us know if we can help you out. Thank you again for attending and hope you have a great day. Thank you.